and we are live. Hi, welcome to our webinar, um, which is the Gray Parrot Anatomy Project, uh, an update and relevance to all parrot species with Dr. Scott Eccles. Welcome, Dr. Eccles. Hello. <laughs> so this is a very exciting uh, topic for today, one that's very unique, I think, um, that, that you can't get anywhere else. Um, so before we before we dive in, uh, I know you have an excellent presentation for us. Uh, we'll just wait for people to log in a bit. Sure. Um, in the meantime, who's that in the background? I see that little feathered companion there. Uh, I've got Peachy up there, my peach front of Conyer. She's she's busy eating. Eating. She normally does not enjoy when I talk with other people, so we'll see how this goes. But right now, she's being very good. Is she be one of those Conyers that does the competitive talking when you're talking? Oh you're yes, talking. yes. <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Oh, yeah, nice. we looks like we can just see her tail. There she is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Saw her climbing around earlier. Um, yes. She's got a busy beak, I'm sure. Yep. She may come join yeah. us. We'll see. Do you have any other uh, any other birds there? Or is, is well, she we there? have a couple budgies and a gray parrot. Nice. Do your budgies talk? Because, you know, people underestimate the power of budgies. Uh, no, I, uh, some of the best, uh, if, if anybody remembers Disco, the talking budgie, I actually interviewed Disco and the family and up Whoa. in Rochester, New York. Um, so Disco was amazing, absolutely amazing, wonderful uh, little bird. So I have known quite a few budgies that are really outstanding talkers. Ours do not. So they kind of came that way. So, but, <laughs> but um, they're very friendly. That is a reminder. You should check out the Disco videos because yep. that is an insanely talented budgie. Yes, Disco. incredible. And the family was just so wonderful. Really uh, a nice, nice family, of course, wonderful bird just really great to visit with them. Wow, okay. Well, you know what, I'm, um, so so Dr. Eichels, I'm looking at our participant numbers yes. and they're just like elevating as we talk. Oh, okay, like, great. Logging in. So this is, this is really, this is a very, very good turnout. Um, all right. And, uh, and and just to remind everybody, it's it's not all about grace. It's, it pertains to all parrot species. So well, so, we're not uh, even going to are... limit it to parrots. We're not even going to limit it to animals. Yeah. I'm going to show you a little bit of all sorts of things, and um, we, we really we, we have so much to cover. Uh, so I'm very excited. Um, we'll we'll wait till everybody gets started and we're ready. However, it is not okay. just about parrots. So just want to make sure everybody's clear on that. All right, all right, all right, all right. That's good to know. Um, so, if you're just joining us, um, you're at the uh, Gray Parrot Anatomy Project: An Update and Relevance to All Parrots with Dr. Scott Eccles. And um, so, he's got a great presentation for us today. Um, so, we're going to see if we can get to some questions towards the end. And uh, with that being said, please use the Q and A button and not the chat feature, so we can capture the question. And then, um, I think I think we'll just I think we should get started here because we got a lot of ground to cover. Um, so with that said, I think you have you have some stuff to share with us. So here we go. Are we ready? I think we're ready. <laughs> okay, let me get this sharing on. And give me one moment here. All right, do we have the picture up? I, I see it, yeah. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Good. Well, first of all, thank you so much for taking some of your time to spend with us today. So I, I am honored to be here. It's always exciting to be around people who are interested in the, some of the things that I'm doing, of course, and some of the things that other people I'm working with are doing. This is not, I don't know what your perspective and what you think this is going to be. However, I hope to surprise you with a lot of new information. This is an ongoing study that is actually morphed into something greater, which I will explain in a moment, that involves not just parrots, not just birds, not just animals, and not just humans. So we are taking the information we've gained from this and applying it to so many different fields of medicine, science, and research. And to kind of give you a little background, my mentor, Dr. Brian Spear, many of you know him out in California. I did my residency with Brian in the 90s. And my mentor and I were sitting around talking about how do we better teach surgery to our colleagues? Because unfortunately, the anatomy books just don't exist or they're very superficial. So if you wanted to, to describe a detailed, uh, say, surgery, 
we, we couldn't do that. We really kind of had to say, well, there's some muscle there. We don't know what it is, but move it out of the way. And there's some nerves there and there's maybe some blood vessels there. Move those out of the way. We don't know what to call any of this stuff. And it's, it's very frustrating because you can't properly communicate what you're doing in terms of how you're doing these procedures. And the only way around that is to develop a type of anatomy reference. And that's more or less how the, this study began. So I'm going to go through a couple of things. First of all, I want to let you know that I've actually developed and invented a number of different imaging uh, uh, products and, and procedures, which I'm going to show you some of that in here. They're not used on live animals, so they're not clinical products. They're used mostly in research, but you're going to see some of those. So just so you know, I, I made those. Um, so let's go over the Great Period Anatomic Study, and we'll, we'll explain how this fits into the bigger picture. When this study was designed, a group of researchers and myself sat around, we said, let's create four aims so that we have a direction with this particular study and to help nurture it so that it can grow and evolve. The first one is we wanted to create an anatomy reference. That's what most people think about with an anatomy study is you want to have publications, a book or papers or something like that. We wanted to clean up the, clean up the nomenclature. That means how we name certain objects, like how do we name this muscle uh, or that nerve? And you might think, well, don't we already have names for these? Well, we do. However, there's multiple names for the same thing and sometimes confusing terminology for the same thing. So we really wanted to clean that up. We also wanted to start with a species that is recognizable internationally, um, represents an endangered species as well. So gray parrots are unique in that they're CITES-1 in the wild. They're highly endangered. However, in captivity or in a companion setting, we have lots of them, which means we have access to the birds. Now, one thing we should keep in mind is a lot of people ask me, how do we get animals for our study? First of all, these animals are donated to us. They are deceased or dying. We don't uh, take any animals that are healthy. The animal care team has to designate to us before and show us that this is in the best interest of the animal to euthanize it or it's already been euthanized and then it gets donated to us. So we had to have an animal that was somewhat readily available and you know that's the great parrot as well because there's so many that are kept as companions we do have the option to use them for anatomy studies okay our second one is that we really wanted to develop this is what i really wanted to do was develop new imaging technology that would allow us to see things that we never could see before so anybody can take an animal open it up take pictures dissect it and so forth and i said well that is how we used to do it. And we have some beautiful references in various different animals. However, the technology out there is phenomenal. I'm gonna show you some of it. And that technology could be used to better our understanding of how all this anatomy fits together and how we can use it to better diagnose and treat diseases. So we wanna apply this technology, not just to gray parrots or parrots in general, but to everything. Next thing is, I did not want this to be a veterinary project or an anatomy project, meaning anatomist only. I want this to be a multi-scientific disciplinary project. We have people that include, of course, veterinarians and anatomists, as you might think with this. We also have bioengineers and several other different types of engineers. We have a theoretical physicist. We have uh, multiple different other uh, scientific disciplines, including human doctors, and of course, we mentioned animal doctors, uh, and a lot of different uh, computer scientists, um, uh, science artists, and so forth that are involved with this process. This is not something, this is too big to be handled by one person, and the expertise goes way beyond aiding one person's skill. So rather than have one person glorified for the whole thing, we really want to involve multiple teams across the world, and that's exactly what we've done. I love this statement. When you get scientists and engineers from different disciplines all working together in one place, magic happens. So you're going to see some of that magic. All right, last thing. This is another thing that was very important to me want to share this data. So, you know, a lot of people kind of hoard on to data and they work to publish it. And the goal of this is not to do that. The goal of this is to work through the data in an appropriate manner and 
and then get that out into the world so that we can all use that and build upon it. That's the only way we're going to learn is if we share this information and develop it further. All right. So some of you may have heard of the Comprehensive Anatomy Research Project. The Comprehensive Anatomy Research Project is the overarching research project. All right, and you can go to avianstudios.com and you can search on the Comprehensive Anatomy Research Project to see all the different projects that are going on. Some of many of which we haven't even loaded onto there because we're finalizing details to make sure it's a, it's a go with the actual study. So this, this is a rough breakdown of the current anatomy research projects that we have. So this pie chart shows, you know, we've got uh, an amphibian project. We have our group of uh, larger group of avian projects, smaller group of fish and invertebrate projects. The largest group right now is, is actually mammalian. And then our last group in the upper left hand corner would be reptilian projects. So as you can see, we've got quite a few different projects. They all carry different weight in terms of how many researchers are working on them and uh, how many animals are involved in the scope of the study. In common with many of these research projects, our goal is to get publications out so that the world can use this information. Um, I, while some researchers will focus on very specific anatomic regions or structural functions and so forth, my goal is to get larger scale atlases or anatomy references out there so that we can use these today. All right. One of the first things we, we said is what is going to be the easiest project to work on? Well, the skeletal system. We can use CT um, and it's computed tomography or CAT scans. We can use uh, regular or micro CT. And we really wanted to develop micro CT because the image quality is so much greater and the detail that we get is, is just incredible. And the new imaging technology that's available is making this all possible, both for living and deceased animals. And then we do what's called segmentation, where we actually digitally carve out the bones and then we can put them all back together. And it allows us to create models to see how everything works together. So here's an example of a gray parrot head. This is actually one of the first ones where we really felt like we got a good protocol for the micro CT. So this is actually one of the oldest videos that I have. But then we said, all right, let's look at other animals. And as we got donations coming in, we started doing CT scans at various different regions to understand the anatomic variations and how these might apply to certain uh, problems that we encounter on a day to day basis. This information, by the way, the Orange Wing Amazon is going to be going into a book, which I will show you and talk about later. So right off the bat, we started noticing anatomic problems. We just didn't know they were there. Looking at this picture, the average person other than it says tail disease, and that's M2 for those of you, I'm sure you know, Moluccan cockatoo. So um, what we, we started noticing were several problems. One is we've, we've got a lot of birds with pretty advanced osteoporosis. And that became very evident once we started doing the micro CT, because again, the, the quality and the detail is so impressive. It allows us to make those fine discernments between normal and abnormal. But we started noticing these birds that had these unusual looking tails and we weren't quite sure what was going on. This is an x-ray. The x-ray does not give the problem justice. We just really couldn't see what was going on. Maybe some of you are familiar with this problem. These birds tend to chew their tail down to a stump and it's usually they've usually lost their tail feathers or many of them and they just do not resolve with medications. It's, I don't care how many antibiotics or pain meds or other things you put on there, it just does not go away. Well, we started studying this problem because we immediately could see that this was the issue. So what you're looking at, the head would be to the right. This is the sensacrum or the kind of the bird pelvis. These should be individual vertebra. Rather, we see a block, just a nasty block of bone. What we noticed in all these birds that were mutilating their tail was one of several characteristics. One was that they typically had very abnormal bone back here. Second thing, we did a series of studies called time of flight, which is an MRI study that looked at the vasculature. And I'll get into vasculature in a moment. And we noticed that the blood vasculature was diverted away from the bone. And then we had these dead zones around the bone where there was no blood supply. We couldn't figure out what was going on. So we took the leap and said, let's start amputating at various parts and where we felt there was normal, well, I should say normal to abnormal bone. And 
we have now still a 100% cure rate with the surgical treatment. Once we know where to amputate, we actually remove the, the dead bone, which is typically the case. So there's also tends to be infection because there's no blood supply to that infection. There's no way to treat it. The only way we've been able to successfully manage these is by surgically removing the abnormal tissue, which is why they don't respond to antibiotics or antifungals and all these other things. And they have chronic irritation, inflammation. And in many cases, the birds are resolved within a few days of surgery, meaning they no longer bother their tail stump at all. And we've had a couple that have gone out a, a two or three weeks. And after that, they've been very good. So this has been one of those things that was an anatomic problem. The blood supply was diverted away. They had infection in there. Uh, we could see it, but we just could not visualize it. Going back to that, that image, you really can't tell what's going on with this x-ray. So the CT has helped us tremendously to understand this problem. And then this is what the bird looks like without the tail. And you see right here, we're worried about all sorts of nerve problems and everything else. These birds have done very well. However, I will say that we have to look at the spinal cord and everything else. We do that with CT. And these birds that have advanced disease where we could use the uh, surgery, they typically have spinal cord degeneration. So we're actually not cutting much because it's already degenerated away. And then here's a video of one of those birds just right after surgery. And you can tell this is a Moluccan cockatoo, no tail. And what you're going to see here in just a moment is we're going to part those feathers. And then, um, and there's the vent, the, the rear right there. And then that's where the tail was. And these birds do remarkably well. Now these birds, one another characteristic that was common with all of them is they had heavy wing trims when they were young and they would fall and crash land on their tail. So whether or not that's true of all the cases, we don't know. However, it's been a very common feature. So kind of extreme wing trim. All right, next thing we went into is, all right, let's figure out how to look at the cardiovascular system. We evaluated every commercially, that, that I know of, every commercially available contrast agent on the market. None of them worked. None of them to the detail that I wanted. So two things came out of this. One is I developed my own contrast agent to serve the need. And it's only for research cases. So terminal means the bird is, is deceased and not for live cases, cases. And we developed a protocol for live that works with uh, these live contrast agents. So we now have these really great protocols for live birds, which we do, I would say, almost every day in practice, where we do contrast studies and look at things. I'll show you some of those images. And then we also do studies with deceased animals as well. So this is the product I made, Brightview. And it's the first contrast agent that has that is safe, meaning uh, it has no environmental contaminants or it's not dangerous to handle. So believe, the, believe it or not, a lot of the other ones um, have a number of toxic compounds in them. All right. So let me see if I can go to the next page. I'm trying to advance it. And there we go. This was the first bird that we figured, ah, figured out how to make this stuff work. What you're looking at is a gray parrot head. And you're seeing the vasculature lit up here using CT. And we can even see the large kink here and uh, the vasculature in the neck. This would be a jugular vein. And the reason they have to have a kink in there is they have to have slack in that vein. So when they turn their head, they don't pass out. Because if you didn't have slack and you turn the head, the vein would collapse upon itself and then no blood flow would occur and, and the animal would pass out. So it's just another neat little adaptation here. But we've now had vasculature to the tip of the, the beak, tips of the toes. We understand the blood supply all over the body, which is really fantastic. And we found we could do this with any bird. And then we started looking even at embryos. This is a chicken embryo at eight days of development, meaning the embryo was still in the egg as it was developing. What you're looking at is the developing head here. This would be the jugular vein, the smaller one of the carotid arteries. This is the heart, the embryonic heart, embryonic lung, embryonic liver. And this kind of twist right here is the embryonic umbilical artery and vein. So we're able to now visualize all sorts of from very young to obviously very old. This is a goose that's still within the egg. And what we've done is we've partially dissolved the outside of the egg. And you can see the neck of the goose right here. So the head would be right here. The developing eye is right here. You're looking at heart and liver and so forth. There's a bit of the backbone right there. And there's the shell of the egg. All right. 
And then very quickly, people said, can we do this on people? I won't get into the whole human discussion. However, I will tell you, we have been using this quite a bit to understand human anatomy. What's fascinating to me is how incorrect the anatomy texts are compared to the real thing. I think that we're gonna see a, an absolute change in our understanding of human anatomy and how we approach disease. My trip next week is actually for human research and human work. And I've already been meeting with a number of surgeons and they've been just absolutely blown away with what they've learned from these models because it explains so many diseases that they've seen that they've never understand, never understood. So I'm really excited to see where this goes. All right, hope you're not afraid of snakes. I'm gonna show you something. So we take these models and I mentioned segmentation. Segmentation is where we take the digital data and we highlight that data to bring it out. So in this model, what we've seen is the bone, you're gonna see the brain in a moment, and the vasculature, which is in, in bright red here. So let me go to the models. I'm gonna show you how we actually use this for studies, if I can get it, there we go. Okay, let me make sure I have this here. Okay, do you have a snake on the screen? Yes. Okay, wonderful. I hope no one's afraid of snakes. If you are, um, close your eyes. I'll tell you when you can open them. All right, so here's an example where we can take these that information. So this is a model of a real snake. It's from a real scan. So we didn't draw this in. We segmented it, which means it came from real data. So we can do things like highlight information for studying and learning and we can understand how this stuff plays in we can also look at through different parts of the snake if we want to there we're in the spinal cord right there right there the spinal cord Oops, it's hard to get it just right um we can use this for study we can break away bones you see how this one is ghosted so you can imagine if you were looking at a complex x-ray or ct of this skull you might be thinking what in the world am i looking at wouldn't it be nice to have these types of models available so that we could better understand what we're seeing and where the problem is and if you want to just terrify people go into the the jaws of the snake yes there we go so now you are in the snake's belly and you can see it's like the fantastic voyage you get to see all the stuff as you get eaten it's great all right so let me show you another one um so this one is from a horse study that we did and this is the kidney and never before had we really seen how all this stuff is organized so this is the vascular tree within the kidney so now what i'm going to do is i'm actually going to blow up on the kidney and now you are going into the vasculature of the kidney. You could literally follow every pathway through the kidney to better understand how the blood supply works. You could also use it to study disease and how disease problems work. And of course, renal disease or kidney disease is extremely common in both humans and animals. So you're looking, oh, let me see if I can get this there. So anyways, it's literally, it is the fantastic voyage. I remember the, the show when I was a kid and I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool to do that? Well, we can, that's the great thing. All right, so let me um, get back to our presentation. Uh, let's see, where was my presentation? Oh boy, uh, now I gotta find it, here we go. Um, oh, I may have to go down to, uh, okay, there we go. Uh, okay, are we back on there? Do we see a rabbit? Here we, yep. Okay, so again, we can apply this to all sorts of different animals. Just so you know, we're working on um, a method to preserve tissues without the use of formaldehyde. I will tell you, we've already done it. So I've been able to do that, trying to replace formaldehyde in, uh, think about anybody who's ever taken an anatomy course. I don't care if you're in high school or all the way up to medical school, we have figured out a way. So I'm proud to say, and hopefully here soon, we'll be making some announcements, but um, we, we have been uh, doing this for quite some time and it's working out fantastic. All right, neurovascular research. This is an area that has been traditionally very difficult. It's very complicated to understand. So I'm, I'm gonna show you a couple different neuro tools. One is looking at the blood supply, which is right here. So we now can see into the vasculature, whether it's a bird or it's a live animal. 
I'm sorry, well, we can do it with live animals too. And this is more of a research situation, but we can do it with any animal that includes humans, rodents and so forth. So I wanna show you this particular study, which was published now last year, or maybe it was two years ago. Um, so one of the problems with traumatic brain injury is that most of the people who have traumatic brain injury do not have massive concussive or traumatic events. Now I'm talking about physical trauma, not emotional behavioral trauma, that's different. So the statistics are that 20% of soldiers that came back from Iraq and Afghanistan have some degree of traumatic brain injury or traumatic stress syndrome. And that's pretty significant. The problem has always been, we don't know how to see it. We can talk with the person, we can understand they're feeling different, behaving different, but we don't know how to actually see it until now. We actually have been able to show that we can see physical changes in the brain related to low level blast injury. So I'm gonna show you this image next. So this is all published so I can discuss this finally. So these are brains that came from rats, all right? And all these animals underwent what's called low level blast injury. That is the equivalent of occupational blast, meaning you're working in an environment, there's loud thumping noises, mild concussive stuff. This is just occupational work. This is not a bomb going off in front of you, okay? What we showed is that eight months after mild uh, traumatic blast, which is again, at a level that's considered normal for work or conditions. What happened is these, these rats experienced none of that. Okay, these rats experienced that just for three days, low level blast. Eight months later, this is what happened to their brain. If you can very quickly see, do you, do you see how much more blood supply there is here in the brain compared to here or here compared to here? We, we were able to show that the brain supply had reduced by 50 to 60% in eight months. Excuse me. So significant reduction in blood flow. What was also found was the histology was normal. When the, when the pathologist looked at the brain, it looks fine. But these animals do not behave normal. They perform poorly in maze tests and other tests. It does show that they are actually having some cognitive dysfunction. So for the first time, we've actually been able to show that this is not something in people's heads. It's literally brain, brain, uh, blood flow within their, their head. It's not a, a thought up disorder, it, it is real. And I think this will uh, pave the way for better understanding of how we can maybe prevent this or once it's occurred, how do we reduce it and reverse it? All right, so micro CT is great. It's, you see this incredible fine vasculature and that's what you've been looking at, especially like with the brain and so forth. However, not everybody has a micro CT. Plus micro CTs are small. You can't fit uh, most animals into a micro CT. So functionally, they're not great for clinical use. So what about clinical CT? Well, as I mentioned, we have developed protocols that use uh, our techniques for clinical animals and we've found amazing, just incredible things. So this, this picture is a little blurry and this is one of our earlier pictures, but this is a cockatiel and we used a contrast agent. There's the heart right here. And here's a large mass. We were trying to figure out, we could see something on the x-ray, but it was very vague. And, and this CT using our contrast protocol allowed this mass to pop up. If we look at it from another view, so the head is to the top of the page. This is the windpipe or the trachea. Here's the heart down here. This is the mass. And we can actually see where the blood vessel goes. It goes right outside of it. What's also interesting is where it's lighter, that's more blood flow. And where it's darker, there's less blood flow. So I knew that the blood flow was less up here other than this great big vessel and bad back here. It allowed me to surgically remove most of this mass inside the chest because I knew exactly where the blood supply was. And we were able to successfully get most of this out, avoid this great big vessel here, this vessel and these vessels. Without this technology, there is no way that surgery would have been possible other than just by sheer luck of not cutting the wrong thing. Here's another example where we've used this. This is actually a gray period as well. And we use the contrast. You can see the vessels are showing up beautifully here. And this is a large mass on the neck. Well, head and neck surgery is tricky because of these large vessels. This large vessel was not visible 
to me with the naked eye. However, with the contrast, I could easily see that and allow me to dodge this vessel, which takes a very unusual path and um, get this bird through surgery. All right. And that's that same bird. And we can look at the vasculature all over the body. And you can see that path of that vessel. Look how strange it is, and especially when you compare it to the other side. So knowing how this anatomy was situated allowed me as a surgeon to remove that tissue. All right. Uh, another area of interest of mine is atherosclerosis. So we have been seeing a lot of birds with atherosclerosis. We are now getting so good, we've, we've been able to pick it up in birds as small as cockatiels with our CT. And this is a big bird, an Indian condor, but we can actually measure the flow of blood through these major vessels by looking at their atherosclerosis. Now, this picture, I probably should have blown this up, but this circle right here represents the aorta. Okay, these are just organs right here, and this is the spinal cord right there. If you can see that, there's a white rim around that circle. That is atherosclerosis. And by using technology that we have available now, we can pick up these lesions and figure out how to best manage these problems and then also monitor them through time. This particular bird did have an episode we would characterize as a stroke and have been getting this bird through this. We've done a lot to manage this particular bird and the bird is doing great. And we would not have known this had it not been for the CT technology and the contrast agents and so forth that we've been able to use. I'm gonna show you another one. This is just so blatantly obvious that you, right now you won't see it, but this is a blue and gold macaw. I want you to focus in on this area right here. These are the kidneys. This bird had completely normal lab work. The reason we did a CT is because there was something wrong with the nasal passages. And we said, well, if we're gonna CT the bird, let's just go ahead and CT everything and, and see what we can find. So look at the kidneys here. This is without contrast. Watch what happens when we add in contrast. Do you see all these holes in here? What these areas represent is part of the kidney or parts of the kidney that do not process contrast properly. In other words, these parts of the kidney are not functioning. We use this information to then, again, this blood bird had normal blood work, so we had no indication there was kidney disease. We use these, these CT scans to guide us and to get a biopsy. Interestingly, this bird had a fungal infection that had invaded and caused kidney damage and also the spleen. So again, we would not have known that um, had we not done this and we we're able to get a diagnosis. This is a side or kind of a cross-sectional view. So here's the kidneys right here. This is the uh, gizzard or the ventriculus in case you're wondering. And here's the other kidney. All this black, this dark stuff, this is all abnormal. But because of the location of this one lesion, the only one that was in this location, we were able to put an endoscope through the body, dodge the organs and get a piece of this. So this was critical to getting a good and safe diagnosis to them. So just another example. And we have tons of these types of examples in cases. So um, just want to kind of show you, we're, we're finding so many things that we just did not know exists. And because the technology has improved so dramatically, uh, it has significantly improved our odds of finding a problem. And just so you know, we're actually even doing uh, forensic CT, which is post-mortem, which means the animal is dead. We do a CT scan, and then we uh, look at the CT data. So there was a study published in human medicine about uh, three years ago now, and they compared a radiologist sitting on his or her rear looking at CT images to what the pathologist actually found in the body. So we had a pathologist, they first CT scanned the human cadaver, and then the pathologist not knowing what the CT said would go and do his or her thing and record all the, the findings. What they found was that the radiologist found significantly more, more lesions, almost on the order of 50% more lesions than the pathologist who had the cadaver right in front of them. The radiologist never even seeing the body, only looking at the CT scans. So my resident and I decided to start a study, which I hope we'll publish uh, later this year. And in essence, we would CT the bird before he got a look at it. I never got a look at the bird. He would then perform the necropsy on the patient and record all the findings. And then we sent off the tissues to the pathologist for a third party. 
I, on the other hand, only got the opportunity to look at the CT. So I can't tell you the results other than I found significantly more lesions. And my resident said, this is simply not fair. You get to see all the details and all I have is the body in front of me. So we're actually using this technology to better improve our diagnoses. I'm, I'm sure many of you, especially if you're bird owners, have had or sent in you know, a beloved animal and not got a clear diagnosis back. We're starting to change that. Okay, it doesn't mean we're always going to get a diagnosis, but we have found so many things that we just, again, didn't know existed. All right, so brain and nerve visualization. This is another area that has been very, very challenging. We can use MRI, such as this T1 MRI scan of a gray parrot. There are a lot of problems with MRI. First of all, to get this level of detail, the bird can't be alive because you're going to have to scan for anywhere from 8 to 20 hours to get that kind of detail. Second thing is not everybody's got an MRI, especially at this scan level, okay? There are some lower, lower quality uh, MRI. It has to do with the magnet strength. So it uses magnets and radio frequency waves, whereas uh, CT uses X-ray technology, photons and so forth. So um, the other thing is that the scans, again, since they're long, we can't clinically do them for very many things. And when you get to, again, this level of detail, you have a very special machine that we put the animals in and it's hard to, you have to have them under anesthesia for quite a long time. And it makes us very nervous uh, when we have these animals in a small bore, the small hole, and they're in there for a long period of time. So it does work, MRI does work, and it's good for good, some soft tissue things. However, we've been working on finding other ways. So a common thing that's referred to me, a common problem with birds is PDD. We've all heard it, and that's um, avian ganglioneuritis, where we have inflammation of the nerves and it causes all these problems. So I have had, I don't know how many birds referred to me, and I can just say in the past, since we've been doing imaging, this advanced imaging, I would say in the past 13 years, I have diagnosed one bird of all the ones that have been referred to me with PDD. That's because we keep finding other problems that are not PDD, but cause neurologic conditions, including dilation of the proventriculus and ventriculus or neurologic problems. So here's an example. This cockatoo has hydrocephalus. So what you're looking at here, this is normal brain matter. This is fluid. These are dilated ventricles and extra fluid within the brain. That's hydrocephalus. And the question was, do we euthanize this bird? And, and the answer was, well, no, not perfect. Not going to be a marathon runner or doing gymnastics. However, this bird is stable and fine. And that's the way this bird has remained. We've had a number of birds that we've been able to do that and show. So these advanced imaging technologies really help us sort out some of these problems that we just assumed were something else. However, I've also developed a new stain to look at soft tissues, including the brain. I'm going to show you some images here, some live images where we go and actually look at it. But I'm going to show you how we apply this. Now, this has been very challenging to do, and I feel like we finally have broke the code on this. And this is only at this time used on deceased uh, specimens. I don't think this will be a live stain, but it's allowing us to study diseases and anatomy in ways we've never seen before. This is a red tail hawk, and you can see the brain here. So if you're familiar with the brain anatomy, that's the cerebellum. There's the spinal cord right there. This is the front part of the brain and the cerebrum. This is part of the eye, and we're starting to see some muscles, but I'm going to show you some more. We've been able to do it on every species that we've tried, including insects and um, you know, different invertebrates, fish, mammals, reptiles, birds, and including humans. So this is a brain of a rat. And that's, I should say, this is scanned at one level. This is a clinical scanner, and this is on a micro CT. And we can see it's the same brain. We can see even more detail. And as we scan more and more, we get greater and greater detail within those tissues. And it's not just the brain. We're also doing a project with DARPA. If anybody's familiar with DARPA, I'll explain that in a moment. But we're looking at how the anatomy of the foot, if you may recognize that this is a raptor foot, a bird of prey foot. And we're looking at the tendons here. And we're looking at how those tendons actually associate and um, organize themselves within the foot, their connections to the bone or bones and tendons, tendons and ligaments and how they all work together. The reason is we're working on a real hand model for humans 
for prosthetics. So I can't tell you much more than that other than it's, that's all I can tell you. So uh, this is a cross section of the foot. You're looking at the tendon right here and here's the tendon sheath around there and these are soft tissues. So I'm gonna show you how we use this in one of the models we made. And actually my resident did the segmentation, Dr. Nick Kirk. So here's a cross section of a pigeon toe and we can make out the arteries, the veins, the tendon bundles, muscles, bone, everything in three dimensions, which is the best part. And this is kind of a side view of the toe and this is a pigeon toe. And again, we can make out that tendon there. We can make out the skin, the different layers, the bone and so forth. And then we're also picking out even small nerves, but I'm gonna show you what the nerves look like live in just a moment. And this is part of the model. Again, DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Some of you probably know DARPA. Uh, so I can't, again, tell you everything we're doing. However, we've been able to model this, and this is going towards that work with the hand. So that's all I can say. All right, let me show you some things. I'm going to click out of this again. So give me just one moment. All right. All right, do we see a side view of a parrot skull? Okay, great. Okay, so I realize that we're going to be talking about a little bit of three-dimensional anatomy, and I'm going to try to orient you. I know it's a little confusing. So this is a side view here, and I'm going to scroll through this here. So here's the cerebellum of the brain. That's the cerebrum. This is, uh, if you're familiar with the brain stem, and then goes down on the spinal cord. So you're looking at here our vertebra, okay? And then there's the lower beak or mandible and the upper beak right here. So you can kind of see that. And there's the horny part of the beak, the nail of the beak. So we can see that. So I'm going to take a little view here. Okay, so imagine here, this is the front of the beak. This is the back of the head. There's the brain right there. These are the eyes right here. This is the optic chiasm. This is the nerves that go to feed the eyes. So I'm going to blow in right there. And this stain has targeted these nerves. I'm going to move this out of the way. So if we follow the, the nerves back, here's where the nerves actually enter into the brain. So what we call the optic chiasm, the cross here, is where the second cranial nerve goes and supplies the eye. So let's just follow one of those nerves. Okay, this is the retina of the eye. We can actually start to make out different layers of the retina. If anybody's familiar with bird anatomy, this squiggly right here is the pectin, a structure that we're still understanding. In fact, we use the contrast agents to show that it was vascular. It's also nervous tissue. And this is just to be studied. This is all stuff that is yet to be just studied. Um, and again, we can make out the different layers here. I can literally follow any of the nerves. So if I were to put my marker on here on this particular nerve, and this is a front view. So we're looking, there's the brain, there's the eyes, there's that nerve I was looking at. All these things right here are muscles. So we can see how the muscles are oriented in the body in three dimensions. Using segmentation allows us to put everything together into a full model. So if I were to blow up on that nerve, and you can see there's more nerves down here, I can actually follow it all through the body. And I can see, everybody's following me right here. We can track these, and for the first time, we're going to be able to and see that nerve just split into one, two, and three different components. And it's split again. These are nerves going off to supply different parts of the area. So I'm just going to follow this around. And I, I already know where this nerve is going. And there it is right there. So I'm gonna give you a side view just to show you where we're at. You can see we started way down here and we went up here and down here. Okay. Now I'm gonna follow it some more. And you can see I'm joined by the left and the right side of this nerve. We're actually in the upper beak. So if I follow this down, There's that nerve right there. This nerve, right there, it is right there, is going to serve the beak. So we can actually start to understand how the 
nerves affect area. This means we can start to look at different ways of managing pain, understanding how, uh, you know, if we wanted to block an area and do so, there's so many things that we can do with this information. And this is brand new. I'm going to change this here, new share. Let me go back to our presentation. Oh, that didn't work. Let me try this again. Here we go. Okay, so there's some stuff I, I can't um, get into that we found, but yesterday I met with two different teams from two different universities, and we literally discovered something on that scan that I just showed you that is going to revolutionize some information on bird beaks and how we do beak trims and how it affects the birds. If anybody thinks of this, they've had their birds beak trim and then their bird didn't want to eat for a couple of days, I know why now. We, we have a clear understanding as to what that has happened. And we are now in the process of getting a study formally going and hopefully to get that stuff out as soon as possible. So these things take time, but these are just one of the many examples of things that we are discovering on a just rather continual basis. All right, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> We're not done yet. <laughs> The power of the uh, live. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Is it correct or not? I will finish it. Is it correct or not? No. Please go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, with the pandemic comes the homeschool teacher. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So diffusion tensor imaging is another way that we can look at nerves. So I'm going to show you this as well. I'm not going to get into the science. It's pretty complicated. Um, but let me just show you what it can do. So do you see here? Do you see the two eyes right there? Yep. Is that visible? Okay, great. So in this model, we can actually look at and study the nerves as they pass through specific parts. This is a very specific type of MRI scan. You can see I can blow up here and I can uh, zoom in and out of planes. I can change that. But let's take that same area. Remember that optic chiasm, you can really see the X right here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to lay a seed and I'm going to tell the computer, tell me everything that passes through this region. I want to see how it how it works and we call this fiber tracking. So what I'm doing is I'm showing all the nerves that pass through that little square that I placed and how they interrelate with different parts of the brain. So you can see that that one that we already showed you that the nerve actually went right to the eye, which we now know we can see that very well. The colors represent the change of direction in X, Y and Z planes. So this is a new technique that's it's fairly new. It's been out about 10 or 15 years, but it's another one where we can start to use and study how the brain works. And this is, again, this amazing technology that's out there. All right, let me get back to our presentation. And OK, great. Skeletal system. OK. The, we can do gross visualization and we can also use advanced imaging like we've been showing. There are limitations because you have to have advanced technology to do this. All right. The, the classic dissection and photography and documentation is all being done. So we're still doing that. And uh, see here what we've done is we've highlighted uh, this is Dr. Mark Nielsen's work. We've highlighted the muscles here so we can use this for anatomy references. We go layer by layer and we can do this all over the body. And this is the, although you can't see it here, it's the ethmomandibularis muscle, very specific to parrots and it's huge in the gray parrots. And uh, that's because they have such great bite force. And we did a paper on that to a degree. I'll show you that in a moment. All right, so then we can take all those and we can start to form these uh, anatomy references and show how all this stuff works together. Okay, there are tons of ongoing studies. So let me just show you a couple of them because we're gonna run out of time and I wanna make sure I answer questions if any of you have them. So Dr. Emma Shasher and I were awarded um, an Association of Aving Veterinarians Research Grant to study the respiratory system, lower respiratory system. Uh, I won't get into all the details, but essentially we took birds, we took x-rays of them, we did uh, CT scans. She then segmented out the different parts of the air sacs. So we now have a much better understanding of how these air sacs actually sit and how they are in relationship to the lungs. We can do a whole variety of these studies and they're three-dimensional. So I don't have the three-dimensional models here, but we can three-dimensionally study these. 
look at the lung and we break out the lung and we remove kind of a lot of that tissue that's around there and see how these work. So um, these have created a much better understanding of how the respiratory system works to a greater detail than ever has been done to date. And we've also noticed significant variation. This represents um, several different birds uh, and how we can see them. So there's actually a lot of variation within the same species even, which makes things even more challenging. And we're gonna start to correlate these to the x-rays that we took so we can see if we can start to predict where we expect the um, air sac to be. So if some of y'all may have seen this announcement, it was just this week that we got this published. So Adam Lawson is the PhD student who is lead on this. And uh, we're very proud of his work here. He's done some great stuff and it just got published this past week. So this is a publication that just came out. Um, we are working, if any of you are familiar with this book, this is the authoritative text on avian surgical anatomy. Here's the problem. It's out of print. And if you wanna buy a used book, you're gonna usually pay on average of $1,000 or more. So we've been working to update this and we hope to have a lot of incredible new information. It's gonna be Dr. Oros, myself and Dr. Redding on this project. We have the book at the publisher. We're now in the phase of editing and so forth. So I'm hopeful later this year. Um, we've taken a lot of different species as the orange wing Amazon I mentioned earlier, but we have a lot of different species. We are color coding the bones for nomenclature so people know exactly what they're looking at when they're looking at x-rays or otherwise. Um, this is a foot of a golden eagle and again, we have lots of information. We've localized where the different components are so that when we relay information back and forth to each other, we are speaking a common language. All right, this is the knee here of a painted stork and you can see the vasculature. So we have all these types of, these are actually uh, images that will be in the book. And to kind of give you an idea, working on the golden eagle, budgie, orange wing Amazon, great horned owl, uh, the umbrella cockatoo, green wing macaw, pigeon, red-tailed hawk will have skeletal anatomy for them. And for the vascular systems, we'll have images of the golden eagle, painted stork, pigeon, and partial of the barn owl. All right, next group we've been working on is the biomechanics, how the head works and all those crazy joints and the muscles and so forth. Um, so this is actually diffusion tensor imaging, but looking at the muscles instead of the nerves and how the forces work and how all this stuff comes together. Remember I mentioned that ethmo mandibularis, there's that muscle and we can see the tension lines there. And uh, Casey Holliday's lab has done some really outstanding work with understanding the mechanics of the skull of the parrot. I'll show you a cool paper we got published, I think it was last year. Um, and so we're doing all sorts of different work with different types of parrots and um, just really great stuff looking at the joints and understanding how all these things work. It's very complicated in the parrot. And again, looking at stress lines and fractures so we understand where the force is being applied. You can imagine this would be very helpful if we had a fracture, understanding how to repair that. This is the type of information we need. All right. And we published a study. Uh, Ian Cost was the PhD student on this one and publishes, just so you know, the PhD student who's in charge usually gets their first name as part of their publications. So the palatal biomechanics and its significance for cranial kinesis in the T-Rex. Guess which bird we compared it to? The gray parrot. So we use the gray parrot model to understand the forces of the T-Rex. Very cool. Of course, I know a lot of you are saying, of course my bird's a dinosaur. It is, absolutely. And of course, a lot of them bite like dinosaurs as well, as much as we would think a dinosaur would bite. All right. Okay, skeletal anatomy. Uh, Henry Sy at Missouri State University is working on this. Um, let me show you uh, some of the stuff. I think just the visuals, oops. Um, I think I lost my screen share, so let me get back to it. There we go. All right, do you see that? Do you see a leg there? Okay, this is just one of the many things that Henry is doing. So he's also segmenting out this and then he goes and names the muscles so we can see the muscle name and putting them into these 3D models so we can understand how all this stuff kind of comes together. And uh, this stuff is again, very, very valuable for us to understand how the anatomy works and when we're doing surgery to be able to show this and to be able to use it in a, again, a clinical and a functional manner. All right, let me back out of this now. Sorry, I'm having to go in and out of the different presentations. Oops. Um, 
and I'm trying to move, there's the bar, okay. Okay, let's uh, jump ahead here. Okay, so Henry's work again, this is about nomenclature, naming, identifying the different structures, and this is all incredibly helpful information for us. So when we're understanding anatomy, performing surgery, or understanding disease processes, this stuff is critical. All right, and then we have Jeremy Klinger, who's at um, Southwestern University, Oklahoma University. He is also doing some of the neck anatomy. You see very detailed work here in the neck anatomy, very complicated stuff that he is uh, working on. And he's, he's very meticulous and does really great work with us. I've been very impressed with him. I've known him since he was a, a student, and of course now he's a professor. All right. What about ongoing projects? We have so many ongoing projects. Remember the Comprehensive Anatomy Research Project. There are many things that are going on. Cane toad anatomy is one. Green iguana anatomy, this is underway. I was told we might get some publications this year on this particular project. Snow leopard anatomy, we've already had two or three publications. We already have another two to three in the works. And the goal is to create an atlas with this one as well. We have the lower duck leg, um, the duck lower leg anatomy project. Because of the problems, this uh, this picture got cut off, but this foot is infected. Any of you that have pet ducks, we know that foot infections are incredibly common, joint infections. So we developed a technique and we actually have a way to resolve most of these, not all of them, most of them. We don't have the success rate like we have with the tail disease, but we have a very high success rate. I would say 85 to 90% success rate. And we basically have created this method. I, uh, we actually presented it at um, a conference last year. And this is what that same duck looked like right after surgery or a couple of weeks after surgery. And they heal very well and we can get them back on their feet, running and doing the things that they should be doing. All right, just an idea of some of the projects we have going on. Australian parrot anatomy, which is also teamed up with nectar feeding bird anatomy studies. Australian wildlife, that's a big topic. And we're also focusing on marsupials, Australian marsupials as well. Uh, we have a bamboo shark project, both anesthesia and anatomy. Uh, ferret and mink anatomy is another one that just recently started with the Mojave rattlesnake. Penguin anatomy is a fairly new one. Sea lion anatomy, those are going. Lori anatomy, oops. Uh, sea turtle, sloth, and so forth. We have so many. We have the tortoise anatomy as well. We have quite a few that are in the works that um, I don't kind of publish them until we know that we have specimens and we know we have a team assigned to them. All right, so I have to bring this up because we do need help. These projects are funded uh, through, I have been getting as many of them going as I can. I also, uh, we get funding through this charity. So this, um, just so you know, I have no say in how they administer funds. So I'm not on their board or anything like that. I have no relationship to, uh, no family relationship or anything like that. So what we do is we present uh, studies to them and they, they approve them or decide not to, depending on what the, the study is. And we use remaining funds for other projects that we present to them. So if you are interested in helping, please um, you know, send, send these to the Orange County, Found, uh, Orange County Wildlife Foundation. It is a 501c3 charity. It is an approved charity. And again, what they'll do is then they will uh, reimburse studies that we do that they approve. So let me see, I think that was it. Okay, I think we're at the question point. So where, how do we begin? Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let me give you some questions. First of all, like I'm, I'm speechless. That was absolutely fascinating. So, um, wow, okay. Uh, we'll jump right into a question here from uh, Stephanie. And Stephanie asked, uh, how targeted are the contrast agents you're, you've developed for specific organs? If they are targeted, have you considered developing, um, okay, uh, theranostic agents? Okay, um, let, me, um, let me see if I can find this Q and A. Um, this was Stephanie, uh, was, you said it was Stephanie? I just wanna make uh, sure. Yeah, go to, go to the, let's see if you can see the chat uh, for you. I, yes. I can see it. It was Stephanie. I'm looking for. Her. Huh, I don't see hers for some reason. Okay, so let me let me. I can kind of answer this. So the target, the agents, the blood agent, uh, Brightview. That one is vascular, so it stays within the vascular system. 
So it doesn't target an organ, it targets the vasculature. The tissue stain does target different tissues. I can't get into the targets that they get into right now. However, we get differential staining, which means some tissues stain brighter than others. And that's how we differentiate those tissues. And again, the tissue stain is not used on live, uh, live animals right now. Okay, let's see here. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so Lisa uh, asks, how widely available are CT scans to the average bird owner? If our offices do not have them available, what would you suggest owners do? Because like, that's fabulous okay. information to have for your bird, right? <laughs> CT scan. That is, um, that is a, a big question. I understand this. So more and more of the centers are getting the newer technology around the country. And I've also worked with centers in the Middle East, Europe, Australia. So there are, there are some other places, not just in the US, uh, the UK as well. Um, so the technology is available. I, I would say that if the facility does not have it, they can probably refer to another facility regionally. So there are even in, I'm in Salt Lake City, and even in this area, there are at least three practices with these advanced scanners. So they're out there. You may have to drive or you may have to fly in some cases to get to them, but they are available, I'm telling you, and they're scattered all over the country. Um, and that include I've worked up and down the East Coast, West Coast, and they are out there. And then in between as well. Okay. And then Don wanted, uh, Don said, um, it would be wonderful to be able to visualize what the throat of a budgie looks like as an aid to doing crop needle feeding. Uh, do you have any images um, like that? <laughs> hold on. Okay, <laughs> hold on. Oh, no. yeah. We just got something in. Um, it's funny you say that. In fact, I posted it online. Um, now, specifically to answer your question, not exactly, we'd have to adjust the images, but I want to show you this. It's really beautiful. Um, let's see if I got these images. Okay, let me share my screen. All right, can y'all see that, Budgie? I can see him, yes. Okay, so we, we did just get the vasculature and the anatomy of the, the Budgie. We're, we've got so much data to go through. It's gonna take us a long time to get through this, but you can see here in the neck, there's a lot of blood supply. You gotta be very careful. If anybody's done enough hand feeding, they've probably had a tear or two in this area and they do bleed a lot and you can see why. And there's incredible vasculature in this region. So um, I hope that uh, answers your question there. Wow, and, you had that, that, you're so prepared. It's amazing. <laughs> I was ready for it. Let's see. You're ready for it. So Joanna, Joanna wanted to know, uh, do you have a plan? Um, do you, sorry, do you plan the release of the parrot's anatomy on a DVD? Have you pictured the bill tip organ on the beak of parrots? So two questions for you. Okay. Um, and I seem to have lost our screen where I can see you. So uh, let me see if that's, there we go. Oh, screen share stopped. It keeps stopping. Um, <laughs> let me try this again. I'm shamelessly putting up the funding information so that people have okay. that. Okay. Can you, can you see that? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So um, the bill tip organ is an area that we're currently studying. And I'm hopeful that later this year we'll have some information out on it. So it is an area that we're specifically studying. Um, and would you remind me of the second question? Um, oh, okay. Are you going to have the, the release of the parrot's anatomy on a, on a DVD? So oh, well, okay. I don't think we're going to put anything on DVD just because there's other methods of, of that. But our goal is to make this available, whether it's going to be book and or in digital format of some sort, whether it's an online thing or something like that. So that is the goal is to get it out there so that people can access it in one way or another. Okay. And, and, and Dr. Eccles, um, what, where is the best way for people to follow your work? Uh, is what, what, what website or okay so i'm trying to get stuff up with facebook it's really challenging with all the things going on but um we have a lot of the stuff on avianstudios.com 
avianstudios.com. Yep, avianstudios.com. That's probably the best one. I've got some of the stuff up on Scarlet Imaging, but Scarlet Imaging is more about getting the contrast agent out. So Avian Studios um, lists, specifically lists the, stu the um, studies, some of the budgets we have. Um, we keep, um, as we get new studies forming, sometimes we form the study before we have a budget available because the animals come in and I don't predict which animals are going to come in. And so we say, all right, we have a whatever, like just this week, we had a, an unusual Central American turtle come in. And my goal was then to find a researcher, but I didn't have a researcher before we started the study. So once I found a researcher, the turtle's gonna go to, in fact, we already found a researcher for that. So um, sometimes we don't have a budget up right away because we haven't figured out what it costs yet. We just, you know, animals come in opportunistically. I never know what's going to, I never know what my next phone call will be or email or, you know, so we just do the best we can. Wow. Okay. So then uh, I have a, I have a great question for you from Carol. Um, she says, uh, my, my gray has, my gray has um, 60 millimeters of, I'm sorry, ML, I'm going to say, is that really, yep. uh, of uh, fluid drained from her x-ray uh, is not showing what is wrong. They want to do an ultrasound. How accurate is this? And what is the difference between regular and cardio ultrasound? Okay, well, ultrasound uses sound waves, and when a belly is full of fluid, ultrasound can be very effective. Because birds normally have air sacs in there, ultrasound does not penetrate air. It creates artifacts. So, I actually, the best time to look at a bird with ultrasound is when they do have fluid, and, and sometimes you can get a sense of what's going on there. Um, and ultrasound and cardiac ultrasound or echocardiography are the same. It's the same process. It's just that you're focusing on the heart with a cardiac ultrasound. So it's kind of terminology. It's still ultrasound. But yeah, it, it can be an effective method to look in there. And, uh, you know, obviously, we've got to figure out why the fluid is building up, drain that fluid out and, you know, and then figure out what's going to be the next best course for that particular bird. Okay. Um... And then a question from Stephanie, um, it's, or she says, I second the question by Lisa, any thoughts on wing pit wounds and what would prompt a bird to chew in that area? Particularly, oh, okay. <laughs> particularly in parrots that do not display any other feather destructive behavior are on a balanced diet and live very enriched lives, you know, foraging and flight opportunities. Okay. All right, so those problems, this, this is actually one of the earlier ones we found. There's, we found two, um, more common culprits related to this. One is a lot of the birds have osteoporosis and they actually have degeneration of their spinal column. If the osteoporosis and degeneration is bad in the lower neck and the upper, um, we call it the notarium, but it's be like the, the chest um, vertebra, um, that area, they tend to, they can mutilate their wings um, because we think it's pain. We're not clear. We've even looked at where the nerves come out of the bones and you can see they're crimped, they're crushed or, or pinched. So we think it, you know, whether you want to call it a pinched nerve or not, we don't know exactly. That's one. The other one is atherosclerosis. It's very common that the arteries that feed up into the wings they get blockages and atherosclerosis in there. Now, aside from that, there can be lots of other things too. They can sometimes have traumatic events. They can have a number of other things, but mutilation is very different from picking or damaging the feathers. Those are two different things. So chewing on the feathers is one thing that's feather damaging and mutilation is when they chew on their skin, two separate problems. The mutilation issues more often than not are related to some type of medical, physical problem, not always, or we don't always find it, but that's the more common scenario. Wow, okay, that was very well explained. Um, that's so fascinating. I mean, this information is just, um, can tell it's just, it's just a game changer in, in avian health and in human health. It's just insanely fascinating. So um, I think that's the, the time we have for our last question. Um, so I'm going to, real quick, I'm going to announce our winner. We have a, a, a giveaway for um, a La Fever, a La Fever um, tropical uh, fruit pellets, as well as a bag of your birds, uh, La, uh, another bag of La Fever food for your bird. Um, and the winner of today's uh, giveaway is Ann D. So congratulations, Ann. Um, someone from La Fever office will reach out to you next week to send that out to you. Um, 
Dr. Eccles, I, I mean, I'm just, I, I got tingles just listening to your presentation, watching your presentation. It was like so mind boggling. I mean, it's amazing. I'm, I, and the, the fact that you're taking the time to do this webinar with us today, because it seems like you're a very, very, very busy person. So I mean, <laughs> my, my daughter really would say so. <laughs> and you're doing the whole Zoom at home with the schooling. I mean, you're just, <sighs> man, uh, it's amazing. Um, so uh, once again, for our viewers today, um, avianstudios.com, that's where they can yep. follow yep. your work. And, and uh, yeah, that's where they can get all the information. We have Captive Foraging up there. It's free, so people can watch that if they want. It's the, it's the old movie. You know, it's like 20 years old now. But the information on there is still the basic concept are good. Now, lots of people have created some really amazing foraging resources, and I would encourage people to check into those. However, that video is up. Everything on there is for free. It's just free information. So, wow. Um, okay. I, I, so I highly encourage right. everyone to check out. Yeah. Yes. And also, and, um, you know, um, so sorry, as a, you know, as a, as a bird community, I mean, I, I you know, the, the, to help with the research. Um, so hopefully uh, you can watch this, this entire webinar um, on our YouTube channel um, from beginning, from beginning to end. And it'll also um, include the, the information for, if you want to um, contribute to the funding for this, um, uh, this, oh, this fascinating uh, research and development that, that you're doing. So, um, so wow. I'm again. Uh, I'm just. I, I'm. I'm. A, I'm. A, this is like one of the most fascinating presentations. I've. I've. I'm just blown away. So I. And I'm looking at all of our chat and comments, and everyone's just like, "Oh my gosh, this is crazy good." So, so thank you, uh, Dr. Eccles. All right. Um, and I. And I can stay for a few more minutes if you want me to answer any more questions. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we'll do one bonus question. There we go. Okay. But, bonus question. All right. Yeah. So I'll wait for the bonus question. Um, uh, I'm just going to remind our viewers that next week we're at, we have Ask the Vet with Dr. Tom Tolley next Friday. Um, wow. Okay. You are so generous with your time. Totally appreciate it. Let's see. Um, one, someone, I mean, we, we have a bunch of questions. We have, well, now the questions are popping up again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me see if I can figure out. I... Okay. Oh, there's a um, lot of questions. Oh, we're not, we're not even close, are we? Uh... Yeah. Okay. Wait, we do have a lot. Okay. Let me see. Okay, Don asks, can you visually, can, okay, uh, can you visual, visualize the shaft feathers to determine what's happening with PBFD? In budgies, it's common to refer to loss of flights and tail feathers as, as a French moat. Okay, French moat, okay. yeah. Yeah, it's common. Um, is it a common problem, but not understood? Can you shed any light on the subject? There well, okay, with PBFD, you know, it's a viral disease, cystine beak and feather disease virus, and it can damage the, um, you, what, you, what results is damage of the feather follicles so that the, uh, the feathers grow very abnormally or don't grow at all. So we actually, I haven't scanned any birds with beak and feather. We, the test is fairly easy. It's a blood test that's uh, relatively easy to uh, take and, and get results on. And so it's a very reliable test as well. So we haven't used imaging for, for that in particular. Um, so that's more of a diagnosis either with a blood test or you can biopsy the tissue that's affected. Okay, well, there you go. Um, I think, I mean, we, <laughs> we might have to revisit, we'll have to revisit a webinar on the same topic because- Yeah, I, mean, I see there's just, a lot uh, of great questions. There's, uh, do I consult yeah. with Canadian vets, um, atherosclerosis, Peking duck, and actually the Peking duck research project is specifically on Peking ducks. Um, so that's on Avian Studios. Um, Let's see. Uh, and I try to post as we get research coming out, the results, I try to post those. It just, there's so much going on right now. It's really uh, challenging. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I could see why you have a team of, of people on this, like just in all areas, because it's, it's, it'd be way too much for, uh, for one small group to handle. It's just, you're, you're, you're doing so much groundbreaking work. It's, it's just amazing. I see Shauna Augustine wants to know how to donate a human body. So, <laughs> well, I mean, these are things that, that come up. They are, um, you know, we, we, oh, I think it's a human, how's a human donate their body? Yep. So there's, there's all sorts of things that we are doing and we're trying to advance the fields, the fields, meaning all these different fields forward. So, um, okay. <laughs> I'm being told I have to grade homework. <laughs> all right. Well, on that end, I think we'll have, <laughs> all right. 
Um, well, also, uh, we'll also um, we can post the questions and and have yep. the, some of the answers on the on Ask the Fever. Um, okay. So uh, so we'll we'll get to some of these <laughs> these answers too. But okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. We better. Thank you so you much. I again, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your time today and being willing to stick with us and sit through all this. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh gosh. Um, yeah. Right back at you. I mean, seriously, Dr. Eggles, that's just so generous of your time and, and the information it, again is like, just, it's, it's fascinating to a level I can't even describe. I mean, I, I, I hope everyone else, I, I, I can, I think I could speak for everyone today that we all learned a lot and we're all excited about the research that you're doing. So thank you. Um, and on that note, I, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to let everyone go here. Um, so, Thanks again, and hopefully we'll see you back because uh, fascinating information. And once again, uh, visit avianstudios.com to follow Dr. Eccles' work. And on that note, everyone have a great weekend. Everyone be safe and all the best to you and your flock. Yes, thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye.